Welcome to My Teenage Victorian Life, presented by Midway Village Museum in Rockford, Illinois. You can check us out at midwayvillage.com and see all the cool programs and events we have coming up this summer. Today we're going to talk about two eras in the history. We'll start with the Victorian era and end with the Edwardian era. The late Victorian era we'll talk about is between 1890 and 1901, and then we'll dip our toe into the Edwardian era from about 1901 to about 1910. Midway Village shows life at the turn of the century, so about between 1890 and 1910. The Victorian era is defined by the British monarch Queen Victoria who reigned from 1837 to her death in 1901. She was followed by her son, Edward, hence Edwardian period. But today what we're gonna talk about is a specific group of people that started to emerge at this time period known as the adolescent. Today, we would call them teenagers. In 1898, a psychologist started to define the age group from age 15 to 24 as adolescents with a defined set of ideals, characteristics, and lifestyle from children and adults. Later, by the 1940s, that age would be changed from 13 to 18, hence teenagers. But we are going to start talking about why that change became known. Queen Victoria herself became queen when she was just a teenager in 1837 at age 18. But it wasn't until many societal changes in the later years of her reign that this definitive group began, began to emerge. So today we are going to talk about the fashion, the recreation, the lifestyle, and some of the new technologies that would help define this new age group that started to emerge at the end of the 19th century. Now, we're going to start with fashion because it's my favorite. So the boys will have to just sit back for a couple of minutes because men's fashion hasn't changed that much, but women's fashion has changed a lot. Fashion in the late Victorian period changed greatly during each decade, from the hoop skirts of the 1860s to the bustle of the 1870s and 80s. The 1890s was the age of the puffed sleeve. Known as the mutton chop, these sleeves grew so large that outerwear had to be adapted to fit over them. And internally, they had to be supported by cotton form or some other base because they were so large. To offset the giant sleeves, you would often see women with very, very narrow waists, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Today, for us, these shoulders appear quite ridiculous, and in many cases, likened to a linebacker's uniform more than a fashion choice. They began in the 1880s, towards the end of the decade, as a quite small puff, reaching maximum size mid-decade, and then began to shrink again by the end of the 1890s. This is an 1890s day dress, and this is a lamb chop. You do see quite a resemblance. This is the fashion in the 1890s. Little bit of a puff sleeve, 1895, giant puff sleeve. 1899, back down to something more normal. 
This silhouette in 1899 would become quite common until the 1920s. By 1900, the new fashion was the shirtwaist. Today, we would think of this more as a blouse. The shirtwaist was a tailored shirt, often tailored like a man's, but with a high neck, cuff sleeves at the wrist, and could be embellished with lace, ruffles, or ribbon. They were often factory made, often by women, and as they were ready to make, were relatively cheap in comparison to custom made clothing. A shirt waist, a narrow skirt, and a matching suit jacket became the uniform of young women leaving high school, entering college, the workforce, or participating in recreation. This style would be relatively popular until World War I. The young girl walking here is wearing a shirt waist and a narrow skirt. She is clearly a teenager and is wearing something that does not quite touch the ground. Very similar to this outfit here, which would have been worn in summer as it is three quarter length sleeves. The woman on this side is a working lady, probably about 20 years old. She has Gibson girl hairstyle, a shirt waist, narrow skirt, and tie. Very similar to the outfit on the right. The skirt is what would denote how old someone was. We'll look at some of these pictures and that will help tell how old some of these girls are. These photos were taken in London, England between 1890 and 1910. You can see clearly the younger girls and as they get older, the skirts do drop lower. You can clearly tell that this girl with the big bow on her hat is younger than the girl holding the bag or the two girls in the picture on the far left. Older still is the girl with the two braids. You still know that she is a young woman by the fact that her dress does not quite meet the ground yet as the woman next to her and her hair is in two braids. Two braids or hair down as the other girls in the photos was still a hairstyle worn by young girls. Once you were older, your hair would be up. And of course, no outfit is complete without the undergarments. And in this case, it did in fact mean a corset. Now a corset's main purpose is of course support, but it also helps with posture. And in many cases, the petticoats and the skirts that you are wearing are quite heavy. And so the corset does help support that weight on your waist and hips, as you did wear skirts and petticoats at your waist. Not everyone, and very few people actually, tight laced which is what you see in movies today, where they tie it really, really tight. When properly fitted, you can do almost anything in a corset that we can do today, including riding bicycles, playing sports, climbing trees, working jobs, often in factories, and many other things. However, you did have to train your body to wear a corset. And now we're going to look at some images of a specific type of corset starting when you were quite young. This is a series of corsets. Corsets were mostly worn for good posture and health until you did reach a certain age when they were worn to not only support the body, but also to support the layers of clothing you were wearing. So girls as young as seven to 12 in this image are wearing a lace back corset. And then our teenagers, 12 to 17, 
are starting to wear what is more the traditional corset where you see the shape starting to be framed. Another popular style of dress for young girls, the turn of the century and up to World War I was the tea gown. The tea gown had originally been developed as an easy to don, loose wrap style dress that a woman could wear during the day because she didn't need a maid to help her put it on. However, as the Victorian era ended, this corset-less dress was seen more and more in company. And eventually it would become a staple of an afternoon tea dress for young women. You will see many of these dresses in photos and pictures from the Edwardian period. For outdoor wear in the summer, these items are mostly made of white eyelet lace and sheer fabric. On the other hand, in the fall, they would be heavier silks and darker colors. Many of these survive, and we have quite a few in our collection here at the museum. Cycling, swimming, golf, tennis, even basketball became regular activities for young ladies starting in the 1890s and clothing needed to adapt to allow them to participate in these activities. For cycling, women often wore a split skirt that looked like a regular skirt when standing, but was actually wide-legged pants. Others wore knickers, which are short pants to the knee, and then covered the leg with stockings. Others just wore shorter skirts. Again, stockings covered the legs a woman would always be properly dressed. Now with all that fashion for young women, we do have to talk about the fashion for men just briefly. Now, it didn't change all that much. In the beginning of the Victorian era in 1837 to the end of the Victorian era in 1901, nor did it really change that much through today. A young boy might start out in a shirt with a suit coat, a course a hat, and knickers. And by teenagehood, he's wearing a shirt, a suit coat, a hat, and long pants. In a formal setting, a young man may add a tie and a vest to his ensemble. When playing sports, he may also don knickers again. The biggest innovation in men's fashion in this time period would be the addition of cuffs in the 1890s to pants. Now here, if you look at this picture, you can see some of those styles that I talked about with the younger boys in the knickers. We also have this little suit outfit with the sailor collar. And then we have the older boys who are in pants. Then if we look at this photo of them playing baseball, we can see some of the older boys are wearing knickers. You can see the short pants are the ones that come up to the knee um, or just below the knee depending on how the picture is when they're sitting and then they have their stockings up covering the leg. Picture this. It is Rockford in 1860. Civil War has not started yet. You are 16 years old. You own or your parents own a farm and you are thinking about getting married. You are a young lady. Your parents are friends with other people in the community. They would introduce you to a number of candidates, appropriate candidates. You would meet those candidates often in the home in front of your parents maybe their parents. You would sit on the porch, you would talk, uh, you would discuss your likes, your dislikes, while your parents discussed financial benefits, um, how the man would support the young woman, and eventually after meeting quite a few candidates, you would decide on the one you liked best, or your parents would decide on the one you on the one you liked best and then 
you would be able to be seen in public, perhaps. Most of your courting would take place in uh, the home under the watchful eye of a chaperone or at approved social gatherings, such as dances in the community or other small gatherings like that. Love was not the primary concern in choosing a partner most often. That could come later. That is what we call courting. That began to change significantly at the turn of the century. The goal, instead of finding a life partner, became more about social interaction for fun and falling in love rather than financial benefit. One of the big changes that caused this was high school. Consolidated high schools became much more common, which meant that children from farther away, not just your immediate community, were being bussed into the city, were brought into the city for consolidated high school classes. High school was mandatory for young people, which allowed for the interaction of youth of the opposite sex in classes, at school dances, at sporting events, and more social gatherings. More men and women both began to move away from home to either attend college or to find jobs in the cities, giving them more freedom and less oversight by adults. These opportunities opened up a large pool of potential partners and a larger pool of potential activities to do together for fun. And if you fell in love, then you talked of marriage. For example, one of those activities available to students in high school became dances. Dances were an opportunity while still chaperoned for boys and girls to interact together. Let me explain to you a little bit what you have seen here. This was for the senior and junior prom in 1914. What they called it a reception. Prom isn't used really until later. Each girl would be given one of these with the program inside. But then on this side, it lists all the dances. Now, their next age dance, the boy would write his name, and that would be her partner for that dance. So this young lady did take a break for a couple of dances, but you can see they had a waltz, a one step, two step, a Dorothea, a tango, S. Putnam, Walt Lament, C. Phelps. You try not to dance too many dances with the same gentleman. That was your dance book. And you would hang it from your wrist. This one is from Rockford High School. As the purpose changed, so did the name. Courtship became known as dating. The first printed use of this word is attributed to an 1896 article in the Chicago Record in reference to the date of which they would go out. Example, the boys are filling all my dates. And nothing helped dating more than the invention of the automobile. The automobile made it possible for freedom to be away from the watchful eye of parents and chaperones, the ability to go further from home, increasing the opportunity for recreation to be alone together. Not only did the new technology, the automobile, help with dating, but the automobile itself became a new form of recreation. Driving parks, driving trips, and just driving 
became an activity that many people, including youths, liked to do just for fun. Another activity, roller skating, had been around for decades, especially in Europe. But with the advent of mass production in factories, they became more available and cheaper to regular people. This caused a boom in popularity across the United States from 1880 to 1910. Roller skating parks and rinks opened up all over. Specific marketing campaigns aimed specifically at this new group of young people made it become a common sight to see people skating through the parks together with their sweethearts. Roller skating was an activity you could do in the warm weather where if your sweetheart started to fall, it would not be untoward to grab her hand. We have a metal roller skate. With a leather strap, so you wore your shoes while wearing this. Definitely for a girl, she would need a flat shoe, not a heel. You put your foot in here, leather strap would go around your ankle. This particular one was made in the Chapin Stevens Company, Pine Meadow, Connecticut. And it does still roll. And the ice skates are similar, except for instead of rolling, they're a blade. The winter version of roller skating, of course, is ice skating, which is also incredibly popular. Here in Rockford, many people skated on the Rock River, as you can see in these photos. Now, the it thing to do at the turn of the century was cycling. Not only did it provide more opportunities for work and became the main mode of transportation for many people, including young people, but it provided more opportunities for play. This is the Rockford High School class of 1901. You can clearly see the bicycles right there. And then there's the class of 1901. Harkening back to the fashion, you can see the boys in their pants, jackets, suits, and ties. Most of the girls are in their shirtwaists. Narrow skirt, hair done like a Gibson girl. Wheeled vehicles had been around for a while, including the high wheeler, but in 1885, a bicycle known as the safety bicycle was created that had two wheels of the same size and a chain. This made riding much more practical. With this invention, cycling expanded rapidly. Bicycle mania even hit Rockford. A local horse racing track was adapted into a driving park, which also had foot races and bicycle races, including exhibitions and amateur riding. Spending the day riding around a park and having a picnic was a wonderful way to spend the afternoon if you were a young person in the late 1890s. For example, this photo from Rockford is a group of cyclists on the 4th of July. Here is the High Wheeler that the museum has in its collection. This is a little bit earlier than our era, and these gentlemen are a little bit older. But here is a bicycle club from Rockford. The gentleman in the front looks like he could be a teenager. And there's a high wheeler.
Baseball had been around since the 1850s and had become a professional sport as early as the 1860s and 70s, but we can't leave it out here as it continued to be one of the most played sports of young boys and teenagers well through the turn of the century. Here we have a baseball glove from a Rockford team around 1910. Now another sport was just starting to become popular in the professional league. American football had been around for a while, but it began to evolve starting in the 1890s. It was being played in high schools and colleges across the United States, including here in Rockford, but it wasn't until 1892 when it became a professional sport. The first paid player on record was William Pudge Heffelfinger when he was offered $500 when he was offered $500 to play for the Allegheny Athletic Club. Pudge had played in both high school in Minnesota and in college at Yale. So here we have our football helmet, much different than the helmets of today. Simple chin strap, no face mask or anything like that. Simple leather. Take a look on the inside. Not a lot of padding in there. And that was what they would wear. Yale was a center of sporting excellence at the turn of the century, but it was at a YMCA training school in Springfield, Massachusetts, where a group of bored football players in the winter led to the invention of a brand new sport, basketball. James Naismith realized that his football players needed an active way to burn off energy in the off season. So in 1892, he invented the game basketball. Yes, the original game was spelled basket space ball. The original game was also played with two peach crates hung at each end of the gym and no dribbling was one of the biggest differences included in the 13 original rules. It was developed as a mashup of soccer, football, and some playground games. The first game was played with a soccer ball and nine players. The score ended in one to zero. With football teams at the time having 10 players, splitting them into two teams of five quickly became the norm for basketball. The game spread quickly among both girls and boys in high schools and colleges. Now we don't think about it today, but another huge form of recreation was photography. In 1888, George Eastman introduced the Kodak Brownie camera. It is considered one of the most important cameras in history as it introduced photography to the general public and made it accessible to amateurs. The original Brownie camera took 100 pictures and cost about $25, which today is about $700. This might seem like a very low number of pictures for us today when we're used to taking 100 pictures in bursts on our cell phones in two seconds, but this was a huge change for Victorians. Before this camera, you had to either hire a professional photographer to come to you or go to a professional studio. Many people had no photographs of themselves or family members, except for perhaps a formal portrait. It was a professional process that included chemicals in a dark room 
and many other items that were not accessible to the regular person. It could be expensive as well, or a photo taken by a professional, if anything at all. The portable brownie Kodak camera made it possible for young people to take photographs on their recreational adventures. As the 1910s came to a close, there would be another societal shift that would temporarily halt the development of adolescents into their own individual group. In 1914, war broke out in Europe, significantly changing the lives of teenagers across the world. Here in America, the war started in 1917 in April. Boys as young as 17 were eligible for the draft. Being drafted into the trenches of World War I quickly forced young men to grow up, as had the boys of the generations before in the 1860s with the Civil War. Followed quickly in 1918 to 1919 by a worldwide pandemic, the carefree life of the early Edwardian period was temporarily halted. But with the end of the war and the end of the Spanish flu came the Roaring Twenties, and the teenager would become much closer to what we know of a teenager today. Thank you for joining us, Midway Village. I hope that you have learned something and that you've enjoyed the program today. And hopefully you can join us for another event or program that we will have at Midway Village.